Saint Adventures of the 1960s, as written and performed by conductor Edwin Astley, who did a lot of TV things back in the day. And, of course, the Saint was, well, a big star back in the 60s. But did you know, if you go all the way back to 1928, Leslie Charteris's famous character, Simon Templer, debuted in Meet the Tiger. That was in a whole <laughs> decade's worth of books and short stories. That was a longtime radio character. And among the folks who played him was a guy named Vincent Price, a movie star uh, with everybody from George Saunders to Tom Conway to Val Kilmer. Let's see what else. Oh, yeah, TV, Roger Moore, Simon Dutton, Ian Ogilvy. All kinds of nonfiction books about it. Well, to tell the whole story of the saint would take a heck of a long time. And one person who can tell us an awful lot about it is a gentleman who's the honorary secretary of the saint club. I've known him for a very long time, and we're only going to be able to scratch the surface of his involvement with the saint and ideas about what's going to be happening for Simon Templer in 2013. So let me shut up and bring on I was going to say Ian Ogilvy, but that's not right, is it? <laughs> <laughs> now I see Ian no Dickerson. <laughs> Although, well, I guess my reason that was in my mind is that I was rereading my interview I did with you a few years ago from my website, Ian, and it was kind of Ian Ogilvy that got you interested in the Saint. Uh, did I get that right? It, wa- it was indeed. It was. I, I'd always read books and watched lots of television as a child, and. I was eight or nine years old, and I I loved watching Return of the Saint on TV. And, you know, for me, it was appointment television. I had to sit there every Sunday and watch it. And when I discovered that my eldest brother had a couple of books about a guy called the Saint, it seemed natural to nick them and read them. And I discovered the books were actually better than the TV show. (laughs) So I spent many years and and far too much of my pocket money um, collecting as many Saint books as I could and at one stage wrote off to join the Saint Club. Um, There was a very old advert in one of the books, and and I was rather pleasantly surprised when I actually got a response and enrolled in the Saint Club. For many years, I was a sort of somewhat passive member, got the Christmas letters from Leslie, ordered a few bits and pieces of merchandise, and that was it. And when the new show was announced in the 1980s, I wrote to the Saint Club and said, look, you've got an opportunity here. You've got a great opportunity to shout about who you are, what you do, and, and you know, really try and get the Saint and the Saint Club back in the public consciousness. Well, the chap who was running the club at the time didn't really want to do it. So he passed my letter on to Leslie Charteris, and I was away at college at the time, and one evening Leslie rang me up, and my jaw promptly hit the floor. I would think, not to mention the rest of your anatomy. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> But from then on, you know, he, he said, well, let's talk, let's come and have dinner. So I went to have dinner with him and his lovely wife, Audrey, and that kicked off a, a, a friendship, which in some ways was rather odd because, you know, he was a 70-something retired best-selling author and I was a very naive 17-year-old teenager. Um, had monthly dinners with him, had lots of weekly phone calls with him, and, you know, became good friends. One of the things I noticed in one of those past interviews, when you talked about all those books that he wrote about the saint, and you keep promising and promising and never get around to writing your biography of Leslie Charteris, but you seem to indicate that in all those books, they are very autobiographical, that there's a lot of Leslie Charteris in Simon Templar. What do you mean by that? Many things. Um, there's a very there's a lot of factual um, parts from Leslie's life in the same books. Um you know that there's the saint at one stage lived in Mountain Gate in London, in a house that was actually at one stage lived in by Leslie and his first wife Pauline, for example. Um, so there's lots of sort of factual points that you know you can find throughout the saint books that tally to Leslie's life. You know the saint and Leslie Charteris dined at very similar restaurants and cafes in London, but it's more than that. The saint it harks back to Leslie's early years. Um, he was born in Singapore to a Chinese doctor and an English lady. And Singapore at the time was very colonial. And even at an early age, he suffered from racism out there because the European ch- children were told not to play with the Chinese and the Chinese were told not to play with the Europeans. And Leslie and his brother Roy were half and half, so they didn't get to play with anyone. 
So he was very much an outsider in Singapore. Um, when his parents split up in 1919 and his mother brought him and Roy back to London, he also suffered racism again uh, for many years in his formative years when he was at school and at university, he he couldn't win, you know. English people didn't want to talk to Asian people. Asian people, if there were some in London, didn't really want to know him because he had an English gene running through him. So his creation of the saint, who is, you know, pretty much an outsider himself, was very much a sort of element of wish fulfillment on his part. Oh, I remember reading that Leslie thought that the saint was kind of his dream self, that wish fulfillment you were talking about that Simon Templer was doing all the things that Leslie Charters himself couldn't do. Absolutely, but then Leslie was very realistic, and, and there's a quote um, from Leslie, you know, he points out that he is not Simon Templer, and Simon Templer is not he, for Simon Templer is physically faster, better, smarter, but there is a strong element of, wouldn't it be nice if I was a superhero sort of thing running through it? Oh, sure, that's, that gets almost on everybody's kind of superhero creations, whether it be James Bond or uh, Leslie Charteris or whatever. Now, you've exactly. also said in various interviews that the saint, especially in his different media incarnations, changed over the years and kind of reflected the times at which the stories were being uh, written and produced and the media was being um, uh, put together. Can you talk about that for a bit? How has the saint changed since, well, 1928? Hmm. The early books particularly portray the saint as um, something of a, a P.G. Woodhouse sort of character, you know, someone who was full of P.G. Woodhouse dialogue, who had a strong sense of humor, would break out in the middle of the story to write a poem that was quite sort of pointed, uh, and was generally having a lot more fun. And as the books evolved, as Leslie evolved, Leslie moved to America, so it was natural that the saint would move to America in the 30s. And if you're in America in the 30s and writing books, you end up write, getting hit by the sort of the hard-boiled, noirish sort of detective genre. So the saint and Leslie went straight into that. And the, obviously the war would have a significant impact on his character as well because the saint couldn't go around fighting the sort of top and saintly baddies that he did, particularly in the early 30s, and he had to deal with the war in some way. Um, so he became sort of loosely associated with unspecified authorities and helping fight the Nazis. And afterwards, when Leslie, Leslie had matured himself and started travelling around the world a bit more, the saint followed suit and became something of a citizen of the world and a world traveller and becoming a little bit world-weary. And when these books at various stages were adapted for whatever media, um, these adaptations were very much done of their time. You look at you know, Roger Moore's TV series now, and it is just the 60s. You can tell what year it was made. You can tell it was made in the 60s. You can tell by looking at it. Look at Ian Ogilvy's show, and, and the fashions instantly give it away as a 1970s production, let alone the sort of characterization and what was going on in the world at the time. Um, you know, look at the radio series, 1940s ones with Vincent Price, and they are very much over their time. Even, you know, bring it up to date, the 1997 movie with Val Kilmer, um, which, which, well, yeah, I don't want to be too rude about it, but you look back at it now, and it, it wasn't a bad movie, it just wasn't The Saint. But even now, you look at the the costumes and the music, and you, you just know that it came from the 1990s. What would you say distinguished the saint from all the other kinds of literary characters that uh, came out during the 20s and the 30s, because that was kind of the Clubland era, and we had Dornford Yates and John Butchin and all kinds of other pre-bonding characters. What set um, Simon Templar apart? I think it's a combination of the simplicity and strength of his character combined with Leslie's remarkable talent as a writer. And, of course, in all those books, uh, there's a lot of supporting characters that we never really get too much of in either the radio, TV, or the films. Um, there's Patricia, and there's, for a while, there a little gang running with it, right? He did, and it was very much a sort of early years thing, because Leslie thought that the saint was, was much better operating on his own and would involve members you know, of the public or characters and damsels in distress as and when needed. Um, but he did move on to be a sort of sole operator there. Of course, one of the most... Well, of course, we mentioned before, one of the most famous adaptations was the Roger Moore TV series. 
you can almost say it was kind of two series. There's the black and white, and then there was the color that Roger Moore was uh, co-owner of. One of the things that I really kind of enjoyed in your book, which we need to mention, that's called to say it on TV, <laughs> is Leslie had some back and forth um, opinions about that TV show, didn't he? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Leslie himself had spent about 10 years trying to get the Saint on TV throughout the 1950s and had become resolutely cynical about the possibility of it happening, let alone what it would look like if it did actually eventually happen. So when when Bob Baker had finally um, secured the rights deal and got the show into production in the early 60s, he was resigned to it being awful. He He expected... He expected the show to fail. He expected the show to be radically different from his books. Um, but he had, he was on a learning curve. He grew to appreciate what television could do and did for his character. And by the end of the show's initial run, he he struck up a friendship with Bob Baker, which would last for the rest of their lives, um, and had begun to appreciate what had been done for it. I was, yeah, it seems like a lot of the early episodes were based on stories of his, so they had to stretch them out and add in extra characters and things like that. But I think he got the idea that TV was, I think one of his phrases was wishy-washy. They couldn't get as gritty or get as realistic as he could. Is that about right? I, I think so. I mean, I think back then, you know, in this sort of very much a pre-internet world, writers had a very fixed idea that if you were going to buy their book or property to adapt for television, then you had to stick to it fairly literally regardless of whether it would suit the um, the time slot or whatever else. So, you know, he had a fairly fixed opinion that if you were going to adapt one of his books for TV, he would expect to see it all on screen. And, of course, that's not the way it worked. Right. It didn't work like that then and it doesn't work like that now. How many books and stories did he write during his lifetime? There are almost 100 original Saint books, um, and I include in that... 50 English language titles and 40 which were written directly into French and have been translated into Dutch but never into English. I find that astonishing. I mean, that's quite an outpouring. Of course, a lot of that's collections of short stories and folks, they do run the raid. Some of them are very um, gritty and realistic and some of them are rather fantastic where the Loch Ness Monster makes an appearance and things like that. Um, Leslie didn't stick to any one particular kind of genre, whodunit or... Uh, spy fire. He, he really loved doing all kinds of different kinds of stories, didn't he? He did, and I think this is one thing that helped the Saint's longevity as well, because you, you know, for TV show and for the books, you never quite knew whether it's going to be a caper story, a high story, a spy story, or any other t- kind of story. Um, and you know, that variety really did help extend the character's life. I think. I think in the sixties too, the fact he was able to kind of hook on vicariously with the James Bond thing because he had the Volvo car that kind of became a signature and um, that trademark halo that was popping up over his head and the, the, well, the whistle theme, I guess, had been set up by George Saunders. But, um, well, it was actually set up by Leslie in the 1940s. Um, he came up with it himself. And, and it was used, obviously, in the RKO movies and onwards from that. But it, it is his own theme. And even now with the new pilot in production, they have the right, they have to use what's called the same theme by Leslie Charteris, and it is that sort of familiar seven or eight note refrain, and I apologise in advance because I'm not musically knowledgeable, so <laughs> I'm just quoting someone else there. Yeah, we mentioned that you wrote the book, The Saint on TV. What can people find in that book? I guess that came out last fall, if I remember correctly. It came out last fall, yeah. It, it Basically, it is a story about the complete history of The Saint on TV, and that includes not just a series that made it into production, but the series that didn't make it into production and the ideas that were mooted around that time as well. It, it dates from 1945, when Leslie wanted to try and get into television himself, right up to, well, it's now actually last year, because um, I, I left the story at the time when James Purefoy was intended to be the new saint, but that obviously hasn't materialised. One of the things I like about that book is that you've got some really cool appendices in there. Can you share with the folks what they are? I have, yeah. I mean, I've basically, what I've found is a couple of unproduced Saint scripts. So there's one script in there which was written by Leslie himself in the early 1950s when he was trying to get the Saint on TV. And there's another script in there which is written by John Goldsmith and is based fairly heavily on one of Leslie's novels. This was written in the early 1980s at a time when Roger Moore and Bob Baker were looking to mount a series of Saint films set in the 1930s. And 
they were very close to casting what was then a young Pierce Brosnan in the role. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's get on that for a little bit because you've you've hinted at that there's a pilot in the works right now. It seems like since the mid '80s until now, there's been all this talk about the Saint coming back and the Saint coming back, and Roger Moore is going to be there as a father figure. We're going to have a Simon Templar Jr. running around doing the adventures, and <laughs> things don't happen, and things don't happen, and things. Well, what's happening now? We are currently in production. That's the reason I'm in Los Angeles um, with a 60-minute pilot for a new series of The Saint. This pilot has been eight years and two months in the making. Whoa. Um, One of the reasons it's taken so long is because we have been so desperately keen to make it true to the original character. Um, All of us behind this project have a almost genetic now belief that there is a place in the 21st century for a saint a saint who is obviously updated, you know, um, but we think the saint on TV would work like a treat now, and we've been very keen to ensure that any show that gets produced does honor that character. Now, you say that you're on production. Does that mean you've done the casting, you've got some scripts, you've got uh, whatever you got? We, we've we've done the casting. We are shooting the pilot at the moment, although we're actually in the middle of a couple of days off. Um we have a cast. We have Adam Rayner as Simon Templer. Oh, Adam okay. is a British actor who has recently been seen in a BBC and Cinemax series called Hunted. Um, before then did a show called Mistresses in the UK and I believe an American show called Hawthorne. He, um, yeah. I, I should perhaps explain here that, you know, as I say, it's taken eight years and two months to get to this stage and I've become resolutely cynical about this. Um, not just as to whether it would actually ever happen, but whether it would actually be any good. And I've been on set for the last few days, and I've got to say, Adam is just brilliant as a saint. He just, you know, he is a 21st century Simon Templar, and I can't wait. I can't wait to see the final product, and I can't wait for everyone else to see the final product, because I think they'll have a lot of fun. When are we set to see the pilot? Is that going to be this fall, this summer, next year? What an excellent question and i wish i had an absolute answer for you um (laughs) we finished shooting in a couple of weeks and obviously it then has to go into post-production and editing we are looking then to take it to market probably february time february march time um and then basically sell it to whatever tv networks will be interested and look towards getting the series commission from then on so i would hope it will be I would hope people will see it on air sometime this year. Are you gunning for a network? Are you gunning for cable? Are you gunning for syndication um, or any of the above? In the U.S., we ideally we'd like network. Um, it, it's a tough marketplace at the moment. You know, there are shows, excuse me, like Burn Notice and Leverage and White Collar, which exists very well on cable. But looking at what we're seeing, you know, it is very much a sort of network appealing show so i think in the u.s we'll, we'll aim for the networks um in the uk we're, we're kind of hoping sort of sky or itv may be quite interested now, i'm guessing you keep saying 21st century so you didn't make this a period piece like you'd hoped for before but he's going to be in 2012 we're going to see simon templar running around yeah i i you know it's been one of my dreams i would so love to see a period saint production but it's awfully expensive to man that sort of thing nowadays. Um, so you have to be realistic. It's not saying that this is being done on the cheap, not by any way, shape, or form. There are many millions of dollars going into this production, and it looks like it. You see the money on screen. Um, but unfortunately, period just wouldn't sell. Is Roger more involved in it anymore? Has he kind of moved on? No, Roger is involved. Roger is a co-producer. He's very active in it, and we're hoping to shoot a cameo role with him next month. Oh, okay. Well, I know that that's not the only saintly news that's uh, going on for 2013. I understand there's a major reissue of all the Leslie Charteris books. Yes. um, I seem to be turning into a one-man saint industry at the moment. Um, We have a contract with Mulholland Books in the UK, which is an imprint of Leslie's longtime publisher, Hodder and Stoughton, for reprinting 35 saint titles in both print and digital. And the first batch of four titles will be out at the end of next month. Well, that's in the UK. How about the States? 
We have a deal agreed in principle with a U.S. publisher. I can't announce it at the moment because the paperwork hasn't been signed. Um, but by all accounts, they want to go a bit better than Mulholland, and they're looking at 49 same books. Who, in one go or over a period of time? Um, considering they want extra material written by me, I really, really hope it's over a period of time because I haven't got that many hours in a day. Oh, I wasn't aware of that. So they're going to be asking for introductions and preparatory material to go along with. It's not just a matter of repackaging the old uh, stories. Not at all. We, we, we're quite determined to to do justice to the original books. And with the Mulholland reprints, we've got people writing introductions for them. Um, we've got some lovely, lovely covers, which you can see on LeslieCharteris.com now. We've got a very talented artist called Andy Howard doing those. And the digital editions will have um, a couple of extra essays written by um, me, oddly enough, one of which is a fairly detailed biography of Leslie and one of which is a sort of look at the history of the stories and the adaptations and, and its publication history. And I also saw you got something going on about um, the Saint on radio. There's some something going on with that. Yes, um, I, I, I'm trying to do it as not quite as a follow-up to my Saint on TV book, but I, I would I'm trying to finish up a book about the Saint's radio career because there's been 11 series of the Saint on radio in total, um, not just in the US but in the UK and in South Africa as well. Um, and there was even one aborted attempt to get it on the radio in Amer in Australia. Sorry. So I'm I'm looking to finish that up as well. Which brings me back to my... I mean, for years and years and years, you've been telling us about a Leslie Charteris bio, and I don't get the impression that's coming anytime soon. Am I missing something? Possibly, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's not quite finished. I've done 90,000 words of it. Um, I have sent the first... 50,000 to um, a couple of agents who said it's great, it's fine, just wait a bit until the TV show takes off and then we'll be able to ah. sell it for you. Oh, that makes perfect sense because that would be a perfect tie-in, I would think. Absolutely, and and it's it's a great story. I mean, I, I've been sort of talking it up as a real-life saint adventure, you know. I mean, Leslie had been around the world three times before he was 12. Um, you know, he he went sailing with Errol Flynn. He played tennis with Marlena Dietrich and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of meat in the story, and it is fascinating stuff. So there you have it, folks. There's a lot of saintly news to keep your eyes out for. I'm keenly interested in seeing the TV show. Um, I've read not all, but a huge chunk of the Saint books. So having them back out in print again with new introductions is, I think, rather exciting. And as you can tell, I've been waiting and waiting for, well, it seems like a decade for this bio. Um, <laughs> yeah, about that, isn't it? Oh, dear. And, of course, we've got several websites you can go to. Now, of course, as always, you can go to the Dave White Presents webpage, www.audioentertainment.org. Go down to the Persons of Interest page, and you will find, no, not Ian Ogilvie, but Ian Dickerson there with links <laughs> to, well, the Saint Club and um, other things. Oh, yeah, we can't go away without you hyping the Saint Club. How can folks hook up with that, and what would they get if they join? Um, you can hook up with that by going to our website, which is lesliecharteris.com, uh, and very shortly you'll be able to get to that from simontemplar.tv as well, which is going to be the official website for the TV pilot. Um, membership costs £3.50 for a year or £60 for life, and you get and the opportunity to buy a lot of limited edition merchandise. It's only available to club members, um, a regular newsletter, and access to various websites and stuff. What about if you're in the U.S.? Uh, if you're in the U.S., it's $7 a year, and I would have to look up the figure for the uh, the annual one. Um, but it's not a problem. We have a U.S. secretary as well who deals with all that. All right, folks. There you have it, The Saint on TV, on radio, in print, and everywhere else. From the man who knows all about it, the Honorary Secretary of the Saint Club, Ian Dickerson. Thanks, Ian, for appearing on Dave White Presents.